Greetings. It's my hope you're well wherever you are. So I'm breaking the cycle in terms of the recordings of these videos, and this is in response to some queries that I've had over the week. So for today, I'm going to talk about what regulatory affairs pharmacy entails generally. And this is because I've had questions coming from young pharmacists and even some of my colleagues and peers in the industry who are keen to venture into this space on regulatory affairs, but they don't understand what are the details of what regulatory affairs is actually in terms of a practice field. So on this video, I'm going to look at it in terms of what the role of a regulatory affairs pharmacist is, working with the specific focus within the pharmaceutical industry or even in the consumer, fast moving consumer goods, FMCG. Because at the end of the day, the regulatory process are kind of related in terms of what a professional would be required to do. The only exception is the fact that regulatory affairs pharmacists, affairs pharmacists or even professionals don't only participate within the pharmaceutical industry or so, but they can also work in the regulatory authorities. They can work in other policy and intervention areas and all. But in this particular video, I'm looking at it from a dimension of most of the people asking this question are people who are seeking to get jobs within the pharmaceutical industry. So for them to get a job within the pharmaceutical industry, then it is imperative of them to know what the, actually the work they're going to do if they are able to secure such kind of a role will entail for them. So on that account, I'm going to share a brief breakdown on what, I, what, I, what the role of a regulatory affairs pharmacist is or a regulatory affairs professional thereof and what they need to do, what are the skills, what do you need to master to be able to do the job. So I've been working in this space for now almost a year. And over that period, I've been able to learn and also to practice. And the key areas that I'm going to mention are based on my experiences, my observations, and the things that I consider critical as a practicing pharmacist and as a practicing regulatory affairs pharmacist. So when I look at regulatory affairs, one thing that we have to acknowledge from start is every medicine before it gets to the market, before it's even used in human subjects, has to be taken through a regulatory process. That is from research and development once it's discovered, then has to be taken through clinical trials. After clinical trials, it gets approval if it's successful. Then once approved as a product that is supposed to be used, it now comes to the market. It's coming to the market, now those are all the processes. So as a regulatory affairs professional, your first role is on regulatory execution. When a pharmaceutical company is doing re research and related work, you are the person who is kind of supposed to be able to support them in making submissions of the regulatory required documents. So there are health authorities, for example, in the Kenyan context, I could talk of pharmacy and poisons board in the US, we have FDA and every other health authority that we have. Then in the European country, we have the EMA. So these different frameworks and regulatory processes, you submit the documents that they stipulate. And once they've sub you've submitted those documents, they'll assess them to see whether you've met the requirements and the product is actually unable to go through the process that you are recommending. And that is in terms of the research. It is going to be taken through research because the data that you've given justifies its use in humans without untoward effects, the negative effect that we don't want to have in patients. So that is the first phase. So that is within the regulatory execution still if you're doing clinical research, clinical trials. Most of the pharmaceutical companies in the African continent and generally even in Kenya, are not big on clinical trials. And therefore the main role of regulatory affairs pharmacist in regulatory execution will be preparation of dossiers. And dossiers is a set of documents that will contain all the required information that justifies the safety, quality, and efficacy of that medicine that you're intending to introduce to a particular market for use in treatment of diseases or alleviation of symptoms in those patients. So in that case, then you have to follow the standard format of the dossier for submission. And if for that matter, you can refer to ICH.org, ICH.org that gives the, the guidelines on how that should happen. So there are five modules, and those five modules, there's module one, which is dependent on the country in which you want to register your product. So module one will have in the administrative information that needs to be captured as per the local guidelines. Then module two will be having summaries. And these are summaries of the actually the subsequent modules, that is module three, four, and five. So when we look at module two, it will have a summary of the quality information. We have a summary of the non-clinical trial information, trial data overviews. Then module you have a summary of module five, which is also clinical trials. Then that is module two summaries. Module three, quality information. Quality information, we'll talk about the product as it is, any safety issues in terms of the formulation, design, stability of the product, 
the constituents that are being used in terms of excipients, the APIs that have been used. So you have to master all that and even know which sites are producing it. What are the quality measures that have been put in that production site to ensure it is safe for producing products for use in humans? So that is the quality measure. Then we go to the non-clinical non -clinical data, that is module four. In the non-clinical overview and non-clinical summaries and data, it involves all the trials, all the studies that have been conducted on that pharmaceutical product. And that can be included out of the lab work used in rats and all those, any other thing that is not human. It is not clinical. So that data has to be compiled and provided. Then we move to the clinical data that is now include all the data that was collected during the clinical trials on human subjects. That is why we term it the clinical trial. So that is module five. So when one thing you have to acknowledge is all those modules are there. That is regulatory execution. You have to submit the dossier, follow up with the regulatory authority for approval. In case there are any, info, any missing data, they'll always send queries and or deficiency letters and you have to supply this additional information. So that is in the initial phase. After that, once a product has been approved in the market, the other changes that might happen in that product pipeline, and this can be change in the site that is manufacturing the product. There can be other changes in terms of the excipients, the ingredients that are being used. For example, during COVID-19, let's say we are expecting most of the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the APIs from China. Transportation was top and everything. So we're now looking at alternative sourcing of APIs. Probably we got it from Egypt. Therefore, it means even the product, if it would be the same product, let's say an, an, a paracetamol tablet, if it's paracetamol and we are producing it with an active ingredient from India, and now we are shifting to import ingredients from Egypt, that is a change. It could affect the quality of the product. So we have to apply for a variation, a change in the process. So that is another component of regulatory affairs that you need to look at. You file these variations, these changes, to ensure that the product that is coming into the market is safe, effective, and of the right quality as stipulated by the regulatory authorities. That is on variations. Different health authorities, to ensure the safety of the product, they have different provisions in terms of whether you are supposed to retain the product. For Kenya, we deal with retentions, which every year you have to retain the product in the marketed products list so that it's able to be traded. And you have the responsibility to safeguard the public from it. In case of anything, you take responsibility for that. Others will have the registration of the product, which is running for like five years. Then after the five years, they expect you to renew that registration. And in that renewal, you have to supply sufficient information based on the stipulations to ensure it meets the standards. So those are some of the things that you have to understand. Then other than retentions, renewals, and all variations, as I've mentioned, you now have to look at the GMP, good manufacturing practices. Which site is doing it? You have to make applications to ensure these sites are inspected, assessed, and they pass the criteria on what is required for production of medicines for use in humans or even animals, whichever it is. And you have to ensure you follow up on those as the initial core work of regulatory execution. The subsequent role that I'm going to mention is regulatory intelligence. As you know it, intelligence is about information and knowledge. And when we talk about intelligence and knowledge, and it is regulatory intelligence, is the sense that you're working in a particular country and the products are supposed to be introduced in a particular country. There are government policies, guidelines, and legislations that govern the use and trade in pharmaceutical products and any medicines. And on this account, then, it is your responsibility to get this information that is available in the market in terms of the regulation and the guidelines that are being shared and inform the producer or the manufacturer of the product. Whether you're working within the company or you're working with a, a foreign company, you have to ensure you give them any information an update on terms of guidelines so that when they are sending you information, it is compliant to the local requirements so that you don't have a back and forth. At the same time, you maintain the product in the pipeline. It's not only for the business purposes, but to ensure reliable supply even in the market because patients ultimately need those medicines and it is your responsibility to do that to ensure they're available in the market. So that is in terms of one, looking at you as the regulatory intelligence, feeding the intelligence to your company. So another role could happen is in the sense that you get regulatory information from your international internal company operations and even the global market. And probably there are changes that are happening. For example, currently, the WHO is championing for adoption of reliance models so that we don't waste so much resources, but we look at a product that has been registered in an authority that has more strict regulations and requirements. So that once we adopt that, we can introduce it into another country, ensuring that 
we use that information and we have the assessment report that was used in those other countries that are being now contextualized in the local context. It will reduce the timelines for registration of the products. It will make it accessible. And it also saves on resources, efficiency in the processes. So it is your responsibility to look at what new information is coming up. Can you advise the local health authorities to ensure those are adopted and implemented where feasible? So that is also another role that you have. And then the, th the third thing in terms of it, which is partly touching on the regulatory intelligence, but is more on business process excellence. We all work in organizations and we want to ensure that our process are as seamless and efficient as much as possible. And therefore we need information to ensure we continuously improve. When guidelines change, there are certain things that they also change. For example, importation of products. You'd be required to pay taxes at particular level. The import permits are required for you to introduce a product into the market. As a regulatory affairs professional, you can share that information with your team or help them in processing those documents. That is business process excellence. Two, other guidelines will govern how you deal in the market as products that are already are introduced. For example, if you have medical representatives that are promoting these products and engaging with healthcare practitioners, they need to know what are the provisions, what does the great law require of them in terms of promotion? Should they give gifts or should they not? Should they give samples or not? It is you to read those guidelines and get that information and contextualize them to the representative so that they're able to make informed decision and informed guidance in terms of how they interact to ensure we are following the ethical principles on best practices in practice as professionals dealing with products of human value in terms of healthcare service delivery. So those will capture the aspects on regulatory intelligence and business process excellence. The last bit of it is in environment shaping. As regulatory affairs professionals, we don't work in isolation. We work with others. And as we work with others, we need to be able to integrate with them and see what are the best practices. How do we shape the environment? And on that account, you integrate with others within the environment in terms of regulatory professional associations, trade associations, health sector boards, and related. And these are avenues for you to share insights with peers, to learn best practices from them. And as you do that, you ensure that the policies that would be fronted by the government, by the different health authorities, are responsive to the market needs, the enabling business processes, and at the end of the day, the ensuring that the patients who need medicines will not suffer. For example, if we have a product that is being registered into a country and it will take a year or uh, take three or five years, then what of a patient who needed it today? Do we have emergency use and compassionate use guidelines that will allow that patient to access it? And do we have other processes as the one that I mentioned in terms of reliance that could reduce that timeline from five, three years to even one year or even six months? If those are possible, can we deliberate with the health authorities to ensure this is applicable and this happens? So that is your role in terms of shaping the environment. Can you ensure the policies and the guidelines that are being operationalized are responsive to the needs of the market, are enabling for business practices, and at the end of the day, they do not compromise on safety, efficacy, and the public health interest of the patients that we tend to serve in that particular market. So that is an overview of what the role of a regulatory affairs pharmacist would entail, regulatory affairs professional, if we call it that. So once you understand these dynamics, you need to go back to references and see what, what kind of information you need to get more on these, but that is the COVID. And I hope this helps enlighten you and makes you make an informed decision whether you want to pursue regulatory affairs or not. And if you feel it's the best place for you, I can assure you for some of us, we're making the best of it. And we believe we're making a contribution. Thank you, make the best, see you on Friday.